In the early era of college sports, games were held more often between teams and schools that were close enough to play. Buses, cars, and trains were the common vehicles for which players and coaches arrived at opposing fields of play. In the college ranks, with lesser athletic budgets, you'd get teams playing other teams from largely within the state or geographic region, as opposed to making large-scale trips to play across the country. Part of what made bowl trips so interesting in the 20s and 30s, especially the Rose Bowl, was that a team from the east got to make their biggest trek west. But with the advent and ease of commercial flight, schedules began to gradually open up to more opponents per year. And with this ease of access came an idea in 1959 that could have drastically changed college sports in an instant. It's time we ask the question, what if the United States military had allowed for the creation of the Airplane Conference in 1959? There's a little backstory to this one, so fasten your seatbelts, please. To start, let's look west at the Pacific Coast Conference. The PCC, made up in 1958 of Washington, Washington State, Oregon, Oregon State, Cal, Stanford, USC, and UCLA, as well as Idaho, had been the precursor to the Athletic Association of Western Universities, which in turn was the precursor to the Pac-8 and what we now know as the Pac-12. But of course, things weren't great. Seriously, if you go to the Wikipedia page for the PCC, there are two tabs listed as Before the Crisis and The Crisis. That's how you know things are good. Teams got suspended a whole bunch within the PCC for a handful of reasons. So often were teams suspended in this conference that the man who worked for the FBI and wrote a report on teams' involvements, Edwin Atherton, served as their commissioner for a brief moment. But once those scandals became public, it caused a meltdown that eventually disbanded the conference almost entirely in 1959. Anyway, with the formerly PCC team still free-floating and without future conferences as an independent, an idea came across the desk of Tom Hamilton, former naval officer and then athletic director at Pittsburgh, and in 1958, the new commissioner of the AAWU. What if a few Eastern independents joined forces with the military academies and the higher echelon West Coast schools? With airplane travel becoming easier and cheaper for athletic departments to regularly achieve, was there really any reason for college conferences to be geographical in nature anymore? Things started moving fast, according to a Sports Illustrated article written by Tex Molly and published in the early 1959, heralded only as football's jet age secret. In the middle of NCAA meetings in Cincinnati, prominent figures and football minds met in a hotel room rented by Hamilton to hash out the details. They all agreed on one thing. They had to get the airplane conference off the ground. Among guiding principles like academic excellence and an opportunity to go cross-country, as the military academies were accustomed to doing in their own scheduling already, each of the men in that room were somewhat scared of the growing hold professional football held on the sport and over colleges in general. On top of that, independent scheduling was also shrouded in uncertainty as colleges started to band together to form more well-rounded conferences. Pivotal to the creation of this conference was the dissolution of the PCC in that it provided a few Eastern teams the opportunity to pair themselves with the best of the West. The airplane conference would serve to solve those issues and would be built from three separate groups of high-profile universities. From the West, the conference would take the best of the newly independent PCC castoffs: Washington, USC, UCLA, Cal, and potentially Stanford, though no Stanford official attended the Cincinnati meeting. From the East would come some of the league's most prominent independents, Notre Dame, Penn State, Pittsburgh, and Syracuse. And of course, filling in the gaps would be the three American service academies, Air Force in the West and Army and Navy in the East. According to Molly, the league would have set itself into a divisional structure in which teams would play four games in division with one conference game played against a team from the other division to increase cohesion. While the conference couldn't start play until 1964 at the earliest and initially only with football due to the clear difficulties with going cross country in the 60s, they did plan on eventually spreading out to other sports. But interestingly enough, in those other major sports, the conference would have seen divisional championships with the victors of those divisional championship games playing each other in a sort of miniature four-team playoff. Other issues like eligibility and scholarship requirements were still in discussion. But with the military academies and Western schools still leery of too many requirements, those were largely not discussed, Molly writes. Aside from being one of the largest conferences in the nation, and certainly with the most prestigious schools of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, 
The Airplane Conference can be considered one of the first proposed super conferences, even with the existence of the bloated Southern Conference in the 20s and 30s, due to the fact that it would have been created with solely powerhouses in mind. Following the release of the Sports Illustrated article, the public began to slightly panic about the idea of a nationwide conference. A 1959 article from the Prescott Evening Courier notes that the athletic directors involved were careful on calling it a done deal. In fact, it was still just a bunch of old heads dreaming dollars. The university administrations of each school would have to sign off on it. Notre Dame head coach Terry Brennan even went so far as to tell the Schenectady Gazette that while he did like the idea, it was not yet a reality. And it wouldn't be. According to Medium writer Matt Brown in 2018, the airplane crashed because of internal struggles with a handful of talking heads. On the smaller scale, would you believe it, the Western universities couldn't agree. Some wanted football to be more prominent, others wanted to focus on academics more and didn't equate the connections to those Eastern schools with better academics overall. But here, in a bit of a throwaway line from Brown, we see what could have potentially been the nail in the coffin more so than some internal discord the Pentagon pulled its support. While nationwide association would have been excellent for the other institutions, the three military academies were already nationwide programs that pulled recruits from all over the country. They didn't need the extra exposure. And on top of that, with the amount of air travel that this conference would have to find necessary being expensive, it's unlikely that the United States military, which was still in the early throes of the Vietnam War in the late 50s and early 60s, would want that money being spent on sports this conference does not exist without the military academies. So, with the conference dead, the Eastern Independents continued to be independent until their admissions into the Big East, Big Ten, and ACC years later. The West Coast schools continued with the AAWU and eventually the Pac-8, and the military academies began their slow fade into the respected underdogs of the collegiate sports world. But what if the Pentagon decided to greenlight this exercise and the airplane conference was formed? What if, in 1964, College sports' first genuine nationwide conference was created. What would that mean for the programs in it, college sports, and the conferences those teams would have joined? Let me start by saying this. I have no idea. With a point of divergence nearly 60 years in the past, it's close to impossible to have projected what all would have changed. The butterfly effect is simply too massive for us to even begin to figure out the course of quote-unquote most likelihood. I know it's early in the what if section, but these videos are more speculative and conversational anyway. What do you think would have happened had this conference been created? Let's start with Brown's projections for what he thinks would have happened. Aside from making the obvious joke that the Air Force Academy would have been the worst program in a group of schools titled the Airplane Conference, Brown goes on to write that the lack of depth on the Western branch would have created some inequalities early on, with the majority of the power coming from the Eastern Division. Washington or USC would have been sacrificed to Notre Dame, Penn State, and even Pittsburgh pretty much every year in football. And even in basketball, the Eastern Division would have been strong, with Cuse and Pitt running the gamut once John Wooden stopped pacing the hardwood at UCLA in 1975. There's a very real chance the airplane would have commandeered the Rose Bowl as well, making it a very real possibility that the game either becomes the championship game for the conference as an East-West game, or that there are a few Rose Bowl games between two Eastern teams in Pasadena. One thing is for certain though, and Brown and I agree, this conference would have soloed American media. While other conferences were lucky to get games on television, pretty much every airplane game would be broadcast to the entire country due to their significant prestige and name value throughout the 60s and 70s. Forget OU versus NCAA in 1984, this conference would have cracked college sports on TV decades earlier. You'd have newspapers in Florida and Wisconsin and Utah talking about Penn State USC with more vigor than the final scores of local colleges. They'd dominate just about everything for years and years. But what about other conferences? Well, for starters, let's assume for the sake of the hypothetical that the airplane conference lasts at least until the mega conference or modern era. Instantly, the West Coast has a problem. The AAWU in 1964 had just renamed themselves to the Pac-8. Their eight members were, of course, Washington, Washington State, Oregon, Oregon State, Cal, Stanford, USC, and UCLA. But with the airplane conference being formed, and let's say Stanford goes with Cal, the only teams left would be Oregon, Oregon State, and Washington State. Finding replacements in 1964 is a little difficult. Obviously, there are two calls the conference would make first. The first would be to Idaho, the former PCC member who was left out in the cold once the league reoriented itself after its scandals. 
The second would be to Montana, which had spent some time in the PCC as a member before leaving of their own volition, and in 1963 would have become a charter member of the Big Sky. Despite these two schools being somewhat small in stature, you have to remember, this went down before TV contracts and branding really meant much of anything to conferences. They'd become the fourth and fifth members of the conference, but the conference would likely need at least two more. The next calls would make more sense, especially long term, to WAC standouts Arizona and Arizona State. While the Wildcats finished 1963 at 5-5, five and five, the Sun Devils finished at 8-1 with a rank of 13. Looking to move up in the world, both schools would accept the invitation to join this new Western Conference, likely still just called the AAWU. From here, the conference could go a number of ways. Add a growing Utah program that would not see Power 5 membership for another 50 years in our timeline to bridge the gap between the Pacific Northwest and the Southwest? Sure. Maybe in their desperation, they add BYU as well. Or do they try to get back into California and add schools like the Independence Pacific or San Jose State? Or do those three schools left behind simply join the WAC instead, and the WAC becomes the surviving conference? I find it more likely that Wazoo and the Oregon schools join the WAC than the opposite, which would create a 19 conference stretching from the Palouse in Washington all the way down to New Mexico. Everything else is blurry. Could other airplane conferences have been formed with other teams? I'm having a hard time thinking so, because conferences like these would be expensive. Even now, in the modern day, conferences like the Big Ten and Big 12, which will be some of the most spread out conferences in the country, are going to suffer financially from sending their teams all over the place, to the point where their new media deals are mostly going towards paying for airfare. I think if this conference were created, it'd be one of the only conferences that could be able to pull it off in general, given it had the support necessary. Of its teams, I think the only real added benefit would be towards the military academies being solidified as power conference teams in this timeline, with the benefits that would create. Seeing the prestige this conference could attain could create a timeline in which the South's football boom is drastically reduced, with recruits going to the East or West Coast as well as the SEC. Or maybe something completely different happens, and Idaho runs the college football world from the Kibbe Dome. I don't know. Whatever the future may have been, with conferences going supernova, it's an interesting thought process to go back and consider what may have been the first nationwide conference that just barely didn't make the cut, and what large-scale effects it would have had on college sports as we know it. But that's a conversation for the comments section below. Let me hear about it. As always, thanks for watching, be civil in your discussions, and hey, stay warm out there. I'll see you next time.